stage. Uh, 
another example that I want to uh, talk about. We've been greatly involved in, in uh, neglected tropical diseases. These are diseases that are uh, unfamiliar to most people and unimaginable uh, to many people. Uh, Trypanosomiasis, uh, onchocerciasis, uh, uh, the, uh, the eradication of guinea worm uh, is one that we've been very focused on. Guinea worm is, is, is a nasty creature. It comes into your body at larvae stage when you drink water, uh, river water primarily. Uh, right now it's most predominant in South Sudan. It comes into your body at larvae stage, it grows, it gets up to a meter long, and then it wants to get out of your body. And it will get out through your leg, or through your chest, or through your neck, or wherever it chooses to. Uh, you can't just tear it out because it will break. And whatever stays in your body will rot and then you'll die. So you have to take it out slowly. And it gives you a very burning sensation. And that's why you want to put it in water. And that's when the, um, the contamination cycle continues. Um, under the leadership of, of President Carter uh, and his Carter Center, uh, we, um, we've been involved for more than 15 years now in the guinea worm eradication program, where, uh, where we've seen incredible success. Uh, when we started, it was all over South Asia and all over Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, we're in only four countries with, with guinea worm. Uh, Mali, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Sudan. In the next three years, it will probably only be Sudan. Um, and then guinea worm will be the second disease ever to be eradicated. Something that I'm personally very passionate about, because the world seems to have dropped the ball on eradication. It seems small, since smallpox um, was eradicated in the late 60s and early 70s. So sort of looking around the room, uh, my bet is most people here weren't alive. So. So the eradication of guinea worm will quite likely be the biggest uh, achievement in global development in your lifetime when we do that in the next four or five years. Uh, not only will it be the second disease ever to be eradicated, but it will be the first disease to be eradicated without the use of vaccine. And the cornerstone in this eradication program is a very simple point of use water filter particle filter that we built inside a drinking store. So we were very interested in the massive opportunity for improved health and health impact that you can have with something this simple point of use water filtration. So let's go back to the 6,000 children that are dying every day due to waterborne diseases and the more than a billion people that are left without access to safe drinking water and the girls and women that are without dignity in education because they're spending their lives fetching water rather than working and going to school. If necessity is the mother of invention, then we're looking at one tough mother. But our thinking was, we have this experience with point of view water filtration from the guinea worm program, we have the experience with going to scale, going to global scale with malaria eradication and other health interventions. Uh, we have as a company a commitment to seeking good practical solutions to the most vulnerable people. So we thought that we were very uh, well positioned to come up with a response to, to this water crisis. And what we, what we came with was, um, was LifeStorm. Uh, many of you have probably heard of LifeStorm. Very simple uh, drinking straw that I may be overclaiming a little bit if I'm saying that it almost operates like a drinking, like a water filtration plant in a straw. But it takes out bacteria and virus and most parasites from the drinking water as you draw water through it. Um, uh, Sebastian mentioned how we've received uh, Time magazine's invention of the year, and, and uh, no, you didn't mention that, but I'll mention it now. <laughs> Time Magazine's Invention of the Year, Sachin Sachi's uh, World Changing Ideas, uh, and a number of other international accolades just because of the, the invention of life Um These are all great, but none of this matters unless you get such a product out in the hands of the people who need it the most. And that's really where, that, where the true innovation is, because there's so many brilliant products that are invented, 
but never get out and get used. So our um, practical response, or one of our inventions to get, uh, to, to empower people with the basic human right of safe drinking water um, took place uh, last month in, uh, in the western province of Kenya where we employed 8,000 people to go door to door to 900,000 houses and install water filters for free. This wasn't a life straw as most people know it. This was a family version, a household version called Life Straw Family that gives a family of, of five or six people uh, safe drinking water uh, to EPA standard for more than three years. So uh, a different uh, invention uh, designed for household level. <coughs> but we went to 900,000 houses and gave water filters for free, installed it for free, educated for free, and, and the, the water filter was free. An investment that cost me personally uh, close to $30 million. A private for-profit investment of giving water filters away for free. So how's that business? It's business because as we enter the homes and give away a water filter and educate in the use of a water filter, we also see how people stop boiling water and less fire is burned and less trees chopped. And we expect that by distributing 900,000 filters that we now have distributed, benefiting four and a half million people, that we will harvest more than two million tons of carbon emission reduction from normal practice of otherwise burning firewood to boil water. There's a couple of things that are hugely unique with this. Uh, number one, for the first time uh, ever, um, has a water filter been registered to, to attract uh, carbon credits. Um, second, the sustainability of this. The, the, the mere scale of what we're doing, employing 8,000 people to, to go to 900,000 houses, benefiting 4.5 million people uh, with, with a, a reduction of between 2 and 2.5 million tons of emission uh, per year, makes it five times larger than any other project ever registered at, at, uh, at uh, gold standards uh, for the voluntary market. And just talking about scale, we actually expect just in, in terms of diarrhea reduction, to achieve about um, uh, a death averted number of, of close to 5,000 children, just from Western province. And then you add to that the, uh, the death averted as a result of uh, reduced respiratory infection because we're reducing the indoor air pollution when, when water's no longer boiled. The sustainability of this is unique, uh, not only because we've committed for 10 years, and if the pipe and water aren't built to these homes by then, we'll renew for another 10 years, but simply because it is business. It's a profitable business, hopefully. Um, cross my fingers. <laughs> it's gonna be expensive otherwise. But, but um, government simply can't keep throwing new money at old problems. And it does take professional business solutions to stop throwing new money at all problems. Pay for performance is another unique aspect of this. Anybody who's ever worked in global development, and especially global health, have been sitting at a conference saying, well, why can't we get this health tool out to XYZ when Coca-Cola can get all over Africa? Well, the answer is very simple. Coca-Cola doesn't get paid until they reach the consumer. So to build a pay-for-performance model, which the carbon market really is, and build that into global development, is hugely unique. We're not paid a single cent until we've documented how much water was filtered, by whom, how many, how much uh, reduction that led to in terms of carbon emissions. And just to generate that data platform, half of the 8,000 people that we employed were health workers, community health workers. They were all equipped with smartphones so that when one of our community health workers would enter a house, he or she would carry the smartphone and note the name of the person that received the life call, which was typically a woman, 
her cell phone number, so that we can follow up with messages, the number of people per household, which, trust me, is now a lot more accurate than the national census, the GPS coordinates of that home, and a photo of that woman with that light bulb in that house with those GPS coordinates. And that was all uploaded in the file. And we would sit, I would say centrally, but that was in Kagamega, um, which when you go there doesn't feel like you're sitting centrally. Um, and we would, we would sit and see 35,000 files coming in on a daily basis, real time, which allowed us not only to monitor and steer such a campaign in a way, a, a health campaign has never been steered before, at least in, in, in a development country, but also formed the basis for, um, for that data platform that we will later <coughs> use for, that will later uh, be used for our audit. The last thing that I want to mention, the last of the five things that I think is truly unique with this campaign is um, that there are some important corrections to be made, an important correction to be made with the, with the global carbon market. The vision originally is to incentivize companies to invest in clean technology. But inherently, nations need to be developed, companies need to be polluting in order to qualify cleanup. And as a result, only 3% of the global carbon market includes Sub-Saharan Africa. So this, uh, a program like this, I think, uh, absolutely represents a, um, an important correction. Um, I actually wrote a speech also. Uh, um, yeah. So, being here at Cambridge um, and having Students, investors, uh, technology pushers, and whatever else is here in the room. Um, I certainly have an appeal, and, and specifically to the students that are um, embarking on some important choices. Uh, do choose a company that cares, or become an entrepreneur that cares. Um, and the number one reason why you should do so is that there is well, Going forward, responsibility is a great opportunity, an opportunity for growth for the company, for your company, for yourself. If you look at health, 90% uh, of all health investments benefit only the 10% wealthiest people on the planet. And as a result, obviously, only 10% of all health investments benefit the other 90%. The consequences of this is that when an aid organization or a government or a company is out working with something like river blindness, we do so with a drug that was developed for chlamydia. Or when we're out working with malaria prevention, we do so with a molecule that was invented for crop control. So if you're a company with a technology platform, as an example, there's a huge opportunity to come in and make a great difference and close a gap. And closing such a gap will be a profitable investment. The, the bigger picture is that the single largest measure of human welfare is average life expectancy. That's uh, 80 years in the richest countries and it's 40 years in the poorest countries. That represents two things. It represents an intolerable gap, and it represents a massive opportunity. And it's that opportunity that I really think that companies who don't understand how to get involved probably won't be around in 20 years from now. And I realize that our companies out there who are telling you how they're changing the world with their game application or their laundry detergent. Um, and I hope that most of you in the room are smart enough to know the difference. Um, personally, I don't think we have a choice. Uh, I think we're absolutely forced to get involved. Uh, the, the, the single largest threat to mankind is the growing population. I, I saw this firsthand uh, again uh, when we were planning our Kenya campaign. The national census of 3.3 million people in Western province 
during our micro planning, that number just didn't add up. And it didn't take long, a lot of data, to get the company to, so to get the, the government to acknowledge that yes, it is perhaps close to 4.5 million people. But it got me thinking about population growth. When, when Kenya became independent in, uh, in 1969, there were 3 million Kenyans. Today there's more than 40, and in 2050, they're expected to be a quarter billion. This is a country where you cannot, by law, enforce one child per family. It's inherent in the culture, it's inherent in the country, it's inherent in the people. That is just not possible. The best choice you have here is through heavy investments in health and education so that families can choose to have the social demographic transition and choose to have fewer children because they know that the few they have will survive. I think that is one of the great challenges we have and that's why we have to get involved. And this is what my company ultimately is also trying to achieve. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. now and would love to take as many questions as possible. So are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, so two questions. One is, I guess, who's your customer? The government, essentially? And what motivates you to pay for commercial viable? The other question is sentimental. Is it offer on a charity basis as well? Can make a donation? Uh, you can make a donation to our customers. Um, and I would certainly encourage you to do so. We're a private company. We do not receive donations because we're private for profit and it would be inherently sticky for us to receive donations. Um, so, so how is this business? Um, well, first and foremost, the case I showed you, uh, or that I talked about with the carbon credits, um, well, we're outselling the carbon credits uh, to companies primarily. Uh, the first load of 1.8 million uh, tons, of, sorry, 1.8 million tons of emission reduction uh, were bought by J.P. Morgan only last week. Um, but it's, it's trading desks in banks and energy companies that are buying these carbon credits and selling them on to, to their clients. So as for um, our uh, pure public health business, um, when we go to a country, Zambia, uh, Mozambique, Angola, uh, we do so uh, knowing the, uh, the, the global finance architecture fairly well. And knowing that if we, uh, if we talk to Angola, <coughs> then it is very likely that we can also show a finance package from the World Bank. But if we talk to Mozambique, it's very likely that we can also show a finance package from the Global Fund. We need to make, remain independent, but we would help them with, um, uh, with consultants uh, through umbrella organizations like World Bank Malaria to come out and increase their capacity for writing a proposal that looks the way the Global Fund wants to see it. Um, so, so, like, like any other uh, institutions, you work with the environment that, that you have. But we do help with the, with the fundraising uh, for many governments so that they can uh, uh, pay for our commodities uh, and, and implement uh, to achieve the health results that are, that are decided. Um, we have five business arms. One is the public health, that I just gave the example of. Um, the other one is the climate, uh, that is raising fund through the carbon market to public health. Another one is food security. Uh, we work directly with farmers that are paying. Uh, another one is cost marketing. Uh, in cost marketing, uh, a recent example is contracted with Coca-Cola in five countries. They're writing a life straw on the bottle. And then part of the proceeds goes to donating a life straw for free in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then we just started a venture capital company where we are buying uh, up companies and technologies, uh, or investing in companies and technologies that are specifically uh, focused on achieving Millennium Development Goals 4, 5, and 6, with our, which are the health-related uh, NDGs. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, my, my 
my mother runs an organization called CAMFES, which uh, supports the education of girls and women in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I'm interested to know, you know, if, if your company is so dedicated to philanthropy, why you didn't set it up as a charitable arm rather than a, uh, a corporate organization? Because we are dedicated to philanthropy. Um, I, th I, th I think that, unfortunately, there is some philanthropy that operates uh, very short term. I mean, I, I personally, I, I must admit that I am the kind of entrepreneur that is motivated by money about as long as pissing in your pants keeps you warm. But philanthropy is short term. And if you want, if you go out and you, you implement something in a country or in a village, people start depending on you. And you can't just give and go away. You give and you stay and you make it work and you make it work for years. And that's why I think business is so important. And that's, that's why I think that often you see that the philanthropic model um, uh, could be optimized. No, absolutely. And I think that's where I, where I fully agree with you. Because, uh, and I think that is exactly why many of the philanthropic models are focusing on the long-term sustainability. So I fully agree with you. If I understood correctly, a significant part of your business is based around carbon trading. And my understanding is that the EUTS Um, so two things, um, the, um, the certified market is not one that, that we're involved in, we're on the voluntary market um, and we're targeting specifically uh, companies for whom this is uh, social responsibility. Um, we're absolutely aware of the, uh, the risks that are involved in the, in the carbon market, um, but for us a $30 million investment uh, compared to the total business of uh, $500 million, which primarily is public health, is not that significant. As we're scaling up beyond the voluntary market and we enter the certified market, which we will do when we go nationwide in one of the larger Asian countries um, in, in a not so distant future, uh, we will do so in a way where we absolutely need to be aware of the timing because of those risks. We need to be registered before the Kyoto Agreement runs out, but we cannot roll out the program until, when, or if there is a follow-on to the uh, Kyoto Agreement, specifically because of those risks that, that, you, that you're having. Um, yes, it's going to you know, be renewed in a couple of years with no certainty being there as to what is going to happen with it. So, yeah, so what is your uh, business strategy for what you will do when this um, really source of finance potentially disappears? That, uh, gone into um, R&D uh, or to bring this uh, to scale is all private finance. It's all financed by me. Uh, so the revenue stream comes from uh, as we build markets with governments and as we help governments uh, find the finances uh, for, uh, for fighting these diseases. So you were, you were the no, that's a service that we do uh, pro bono. Our revenue stream comes from the supply of these commodities. So you're charging the actual... We're charging for the actual commodities. Okay, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Please sit down. Please sit down.